In the garden area of Castle Larissa, the royal atmosphere was disrupted when Arnoa entered. Larissa, adorned in her royal dress, acknowledged her presence, respectfully greeting. Your Majesty! Her friends followed suit, bowing before Arnoa and offering their greetings. The castle's servants, one by one, extended their respectful greetings, addressing Arnoa as, Your Majesty! Noticing Larissa's mother standing nearby, Arnoa remarked, I see someone has yet to greet me. This remark angered Larissa's mother. Arnoa continued, Did the time you spent outside the palace make you forget the proper court etiquette? Larissa's mother, visibly upset, responded, Your Majesty. Arnoa inquired about her wrists, recalling a past incident when Larissa's mother had punished her. She mentioned, How is your wrist? You hit yourself quite hard, did you not? Larissa's mother reflected on the moment, thinking, But this time... As Arnoa attempted to lift a paper fan, Larissa's mother resisted, thinking, I will not play along. However, the fan accidentally struck her hand, causing her to scream in pain. Arnoa taunted her, saying, I never thought I would see you scream like a little girl. It must have hurt a lot. Larissa's mother, visibly angered, stammered, Th, thank you for your concern. In fact, I was concerned about your majesty as well. Arnoa inquired. Were you now? I heard your majesty was locked away after acting like an untamed horse. She added. Three days without food or water must have taken a toll on your majesty. The other girls were shocked to hear this, exchanging glances. Larissa's mother, with a sly smile, remarked. Although it must have done wonders for your majesty's figure. Lord knows you needed to lose a few pounds. She pondered. How strange. Isn't she a bit too vibrant for someone who starved for three days? Arnoa, seemingly unfazed, smiled politely, stating, The king would never do such a cruel thing to me. I have been doing quite well. Swishing her gray hair back, she added, Especially since Larissa apologized for her rude behavior toward me in the past. Larissa, astonished, shouted, W.H. what? I only apologized because you threatened to shoot me with an arrow. While I was pregnant, might I add? Arnoa twirled her hair and casually asked. Did I? I was only aiming at a boar. Hmm? Are you saying I'm a boar? She provocatively added. You sure squealed like one. Larissa, seething with rage, clenched her teeth as Arnoa stepped forward. Larissa retorted. Until now. I've shown you respect because I pitied your majesty's situation. But do not expect such courtesy any longer. She declared. I tire of seeing you move aside. Arnoa nonchalantly responded. You move aside. Larissa, taken aback, asked. I beg your pardon? Arnoa sighed, saying. I was crossing the bridge first, and you came along later. Therefore, you should move aside. In a fit of rage, Larissa thought. She really doesn't know her place yet, does she? I am the king's first love and his beloved mistress. She smiled, thinking. So she wants to dance, huh? Larissa taunted Arnoa, reminding her of the black diamonds on her crown, claiming. The king said such a precious jewel belongs on my head and gifted me the crown, a matching set with his majesty's. Arnoa calmly acknowledged. I remember. Larissa continued. I'm his majesty's lover, and you are not. There is nothing you can do to change that. With a smile, she asserted. Imperial lineage is nothing compared to the king's love. Arnoa questioned. Are you sure about that? Larissa proudly displayed her ruby necklace, claiming. His majesty even gifted me this ruby necklace today. Arnoa remained unfazed, thinking. I could not care less. Larissa asked. Is it not beautiful? She added. Anyway, I can take anything from your majesty, even though there is little to take from you since you are not blessed with his majesty's love. Arnoa intriguingly responded. Oh? Larissa, showing no signs of shock, inquired. What's that? Hmm? Arnoa calmly replied. Is this your first time seeing a mystic eye? Larissa screamed. I've seen one before. Where did you get your hands on such a thing? Arnoa advised. 
Larissa, there are things in this world that should not be pursued with greed. It's a virtue to know when to step back. Larissa shouted. You must have hidden it in a drawer or somewhere for two years. She eyed Arnaud's golden necklace and declared. I want it. Moving aside, she stated. I'll move aside if you hand it over. Arnoa retorted. You're worse than a boar. You're a bandit. While distancing herself, Arnoa added. I'll end up having it one way or another. So why don't you just give it to me? If you refuse? Larissa snickered, suggesting. I might fall into the pond. Arnoa, unyielding, responded. Why should I care? Larissa emphasized. You do know I'm carrying the king's child, don't you? If something were to happen to me, his majesty would have to punish you. How dare you harm Larissa? Assertively, she questioned. And what would people say? Pushing the woman carrying off her husband's child into the pond. Isn't that what the villainess did in the burning palace? She smirked, adding, Your majesty wouldn't want to get divorced like the villainess too, would you? I'd hate to make you the villainess who tried to kill me out of jealousy. Arnoa, reflecting on Larissa's tactics, thought, Larissa, you're a genius. Extending her hand towards Arnoa, Larissa said, Of course, if you want me to. As Larissa reached for Arnoa's necklace, Arnoa held her hand and remarked, I hope you know how to swim. Never mind. I actually don't care. Larissa, startled, found herself placed along the bridge. Panicking, she exclaimed, Huh! H, hold on, your majesty! Arnoa shoved her into the water, and Larissa screamed, Ah! Uh, help! Servants and her mother joined in the distress, shouting, Oh my goodness! Larissa! Lady Larissa! Her mother urgently ordered, Guards! Come help her! Meanwhile, Arnoa stood there, smiling and looking at her handiwork. Larissa sat on the bed, shouting and weeping, her head buried in a pillow as she screamed. Bina stood beside her, attempting to calm her. Calm down, Larissa! She continued to scream. How could I? She pushed me into the pond. Bina sighed and asked. Did she really? With tears in her eyes, Larissa screamed. Are you doubting me? The mother of your majesty's child? Bina's reassured. Of course not. Larissa sniffled heavily and Binas, sitting beside her on his knees, apologized. Sorry, it was just hard to believe. He hugged her, saying, Oh, Larissa, you have been through hell. A servant explained to Binas. Actually, the pond is not nearly deep enough to drown. If she had stayed calm, she wouldn't have drunk so much pond water. Furious, Binas shouted at the servant. Get out! You use this windbag. Trembling in rage, he added, No matter how busy the staff is due to the aftermath of the Kessman incident, sending that imbecile as my errand boy is unacceptable. Turning towards Larissa, he assured, Don't mind him, Larissa. I'm just grateful to the gods that you and our child are unharmed. While crying, Larissa questioned, What if it happens again? The queen tried to kill me many times, and she will try again. Sniffling, she moved closer to him, asking, Your Majesty, why are you not divorcing her? She added, Are her murder attempts not reason enough to get a divorce? Binas replied, There are a thousand reasons to divorce her. Reflecting on the theater scenario, he grimaced. She enjoyed the company of other men right in front of me, and she even called her king hideous. Binas frowned and continued, However, even after consulting with all the legal experts, there was no solution. He remembered Larissa's father saying, Forgive me, your majesty. Binas gritted his teeth, realizing. He was just all talk. I'd have him whipped if he wasn't Larissa's father. I would have to return all of her dowry if I divorce her. Binas clenched his hand with anger, thinking. But I already spent most of it. He added, the gold that filled an entire carriage was used on new palace pillars, the gardens, and Larissa's dresses and jewelry. Reflecting, Binas realized. Come to think of it, the pond Larissa fell into today was also made with that gold. Larissa mumbled. 
What if she left in some other way? She asked. What other way? Smirking, she suggested. Like dying at the hands of people who have had enough of her malicious acts? On the other hand, Bell sighed, saying, I am sick and tired of Count Estia's lousy assassination attempts, holding the collar of a guy amidst a scene of dead bodies and scattered blood. Flicking his fingers, he remarked, Increasing the number of assassins fivefold won't change a thing if they're all this sloppy. Meanwhile, Arnoa, in her night suit, sat on a bed, contemplating. He would rather send more assassins than divorce me? She sighed and rubbed her head, saying, I should have brought a smaller dowry. It's not like I had a say anyway. Arnoa thought about Luciano's decision to offer Binas her entire inheritance as her dowry, realizing, I don't care about the gold. Binas can keep it if he would just divorce me. Adding, But he must believe that if he doesn't return the dowry when he's divorcing the imperial princess, he won't be able to stay on the emperor's good side. That must be why he wants to maintain the marriage. She considered the timeline, thinking, It's been twenty-seven days since I heard of Luciano's passing from Bell. Binas will become the emperor if I don't get him to divorce me in three days. While sitting on the bed, she wished for more time, saying to Bell, I think you won the wager, Bell. Please polish my soul stone as prettily as possible. Lying on the bed, she thought, Even if I had more time, he would just hear about Luciano's death from somewhere else. At least if I become a soul stone, I won't have to live as Binus's queen until I grow old and die. In the complete silence, she opened her eyes and saw Belle standing there. She said, I thought you'd be more happy when you won. Belle replied, I'm not happy at all. Arnaud asked, Why not? Belle waved his hand, saying, I also said things I want change often. Rising from the bed, she asked, What do you want now? Bell looked at her and added, I want to see you on the throne with a crown on your head. Arnoa was shocked. What? Bell turned back, stating, As the master of the enchanted tower, it would be shameful to become the messenger of an emperor even less capable than Luciano. Bell choked, adding, Soul stones of occasions are rare, but it's not worth going through that kind of disaster. Astonished, Arnoa couldn't comprehend. But... Bell raised his hand to his mouth and explained, Wagers with non-sorcerers are just a pastime for me. I do not care if I win or lose. Arnaud asked, You want to help me? Stepping forward, he responded, If I could. However, I still won't be able to harm him with magic. Coming closer, he held her chin, saying, Take his life or lie to him. Those are the rules until I announce the new emperor. Arnoa questioned. Do you think there's a way for me to help you? Laughing, she added, I can think of a few ways. Belle blushed to see her happy. Belle slammed into Binas's room through the window. Binas, sensing someone sneaking in, woke up immediately, flapping, and exclaimed, W.H. what was that? An assassin? Belle sneaked into Binas's room through the window. Sensing someone's arrival, Binas woke up and exclaimed, W.H. what was that? An assassin? Bell appeared in front of him, stating, I am the messenger of the empire. Shocked, Binus swished his blanket away and asked, Huh? What is a messenger doing here? Blinking to see him clearly, Binus remembered and laughed. Did the emperor send you because of what happened with the queen? He assured. Tell the emperor that there is nothing to worry about. Even though her behavior is problematic, Dairon will honor the marriage between our two kingdoms. Binas clenched his legs together and continued, I shall never make the queen return to the empire as a divorcee. Should I just break the contract and rip this man apart? Bell gritted his teeth with anger, recalling when he had told Arnoa, Imply that the dowry would not be an issue even if he divorces me, and Ludes will do the rest. Taking a deep breath, Bell thought, that is not why I came, he said to Binas. Here is what I came to tell you. The emperor will not oppose the divorce between the king and queen of Dairin. Binas, astonished, questioned. Is that true? Thinking, he's here to discuss the terms of the divorce. Bell explained. 
The esteem in which this kingdom holds the empire has already been demonstrated by your behavior in the past. Binas asked about the dowry, adding, Currently, Dairon is not able to give back all of the dowry. Bell stated, The dowry offered by the imperial princess is but a trifle compared to the riches stored in the imperial treasury. It would be unwise to ruin diplomatic relations between our two kingdoms over such a trivial matter. Bell asked him, Am I understood? Binas, in utter shock, replied, I understand. With magic, Bell started vanishing, saying, I shall leave the decision to you. Binas smirked in thought. I can end it. I can part ways with that woman without suffering any consequences at all. While shouting, Dr. Lucas rushed to Larissa's room, exclaiming, What? You misdiagnosed? Larissa collapsed upon hearing her scream, and Dr. Lucas informed her. Yes, it's a common mistake. I'm afraid you're not pregnant. Larissa held her belly, saying, No. Dr. Lucas stood beside her, and she added, This is important news. I shall tell His Majesty about this at once. Larissa flinched as Dr. Lucas started grabbing the blanket from her. She held his hand to stop him, saying, D. Daunt, if His Majesty finds out about this, my father spent so much of his fortune on hiring assassins that our household is one step away from being seized. If he finds out that I'm not pregnant, he will be even more reluctant to get a divorce. Dr. Lucas said, All right. I will give you three days to prepare yourself. I cannot hold it off any longer, even if I'm let go as a result. Larissa started thinking. I have three days. After that, things went as expected. Thinking that he wouldn't have to return the dowry, Binas told Larissa about the messenger that visited him. After seeing a chance, Larissa pressured him to get a divorce. She added, The divorce process, which originally should have taken at least ten days, was shortened to a mere single day due to Larissa's relentless nagging. People whispered in the castle as there was some event. Arno arrived there. After seeing guests, she thought, Look at all these people gathered here to become witnesses. This is the first time I've been treated with respect since I came to Duran. Wearing a white and purple royal dress, Binas turned towards her and asked, You came. Holding a message, Arnoa bowed in front of him, saying, Your Majesty. Binas ordered her to kneel down, and Arnoa slumped completely in front of him. Binas started reading the message. Listen carefully. I, King Binas Roche of the Duran Kingdom, solemnly decree the dissolution of our marriage. Arnoa thought. Finally. Larissa leaned in when he was reading. Arnoa Saliard Cajun, you are hereby stripped of your title as Queen of Duran, as your presence is no longer welcome in this kingdom. Arnoa thought. It's over. Binas added. You must now return to your home in the capital of the Empire. While sitting on the floor... Arnoa was lost in her own thoughts. I finally achieved. She held the message and was very happy. The freedom I've been longing for. She bowed in front of him, saying, We are divorced. I suppose there is no need to keep up false pretenses any longer. Binas was astonished. What? While smiling fully, Arnoa added, I've suffered enough for the past two years, and I couldn't be more grateful to you for ending our marriage. Binas said. Does she fail to grasp what's happened to her? Arnoa replied. Unfortunately, it appears you are the one who fails to grasp what is happening, Binas. He started thinking. How can she be so arrogant now? Binas became furious and started screaming. It seems the shock of the divorce has gotten to your head, but may I remind you? Arnoa fluttered her hair and said. Bell, come out and deliver the emperor's message to the king of Duran. Suddenly, the wind started blowing. They exclaimed, Where is the wind blowing from? What's happening? Bell appeared there, and Binas was shocked to see him, screaming, Huh? What is the Emperor's messenger doing here? Bell replied, Did you not hear the new Empress call for me? Binas asked, The new Empress? Bell informed him, Now that Emperor Luciano and Imperial Prince Arian are dead, and you, Binas Roche Duran, declared the dissolution of your marriage. He added, 
The empire belongs to none other than Her Imperial Majesty, Arnoa Saliard Cajun. Binas and Larissa fell down in shock, saying, Th, this can't be, Arnoa declared. Now for my first order as the Empress. I'm sure you recall that when I married you, I brought with me a carriage full of gold as my dowry. She smiled and added, Have it prepared at once. After divorcing Arnoa, Binas deeply regretted his decision upon realizing that the emperor now belonged to Arnoa. Binas found himself kneeling and weeping before everyone, expressing his remorse. My queen, your imperial majesty, I'm on my knees begging you. He cried out pleading, Please stay in Duran for a little while longer. Pretty please. Arnoa, irritated by his actions, responded, You sicken me. Binas, rising with excitement, exclaimed, F forgive me, your imperial majesty. Oh, right. Enjoy the feast I've prepared just for you. Contemplating the situation, Arnoa sat on the emperor's chair while Binas continued to beg. I have gathered the finest chefs and dancers in Duran. He instructed the servants. Bring her something. Anything. Adding, as for the head chef, his family has been working for the Duranian royal family for generations. Arnoa questioned him. Really? I don't recall him cooking for me when I was a Duranian royal family member. Binas, becoming furious, tried to defend himself. That? That's? Rejecting his offer, Arnoa stated. You can keep your precious chef and his dishes. Smiling as she inquired. Are you going to marry Larissa now? Binas hastily replied. It's a misunderstanding, your imperial majesty. Arnoa skeptically responded. Oh? Binas mumbled. I thought the woman was pregnant with my child, and as a man, I felt responsible, so... Immediately, Arnoa thought. Ugh, he's blabbering like an idiot. I should have just left. She... Remarked sternly. You always had a great sense of responsibility toward your mistress. If only you treated your queen the same way. In response, he shuddered remaining shocked, and started shouting. I was tricked. Larissa and the court physician both lied to me about her pregnancy. Glancing at Arnoa, he screamed. If it weren't for those two, our marriage would have flourished. Shouting at Larissa, he said. You. Larissa flinched, and Binas growled. Kneel before the empress. While seated on the royal chair, Arnoa thought. Wow, how petty. He was acting like he would love her until the end of the world, she added, but it didn't take him long to offer me his first love as a scapegoat. As Binas shouted at Larissa, she was shocked and scared, asking, Your Majesty, how could you? Binas grabbed her hand, dragging her, and said, You dare talk back to me? Larissa winced in pain, saying, Oh. Binas came close, commanding, Shut up and kneel then threw her at the feet of Arnoa. Arnoa glared at her, remarking, This is pathetic. Stop. Binas interrupted, shouting, If it weren't for her, we would have become the couple of the century. He added, After seeing your imperial majesty gazing into the eyes of the master of the enchanted tower. Sniffling, he confessed, I realize that I have been in love with your imperial majesty. Binas continued, I was jealous because your imperial majesty, who was my wife at the time, was with another man. Irritated, Arnoa responded, You must have gone mad. Binas tenderly touched her hand and expressed, Your imperial majesty, no, my beloved Arnoa Duran, will you marry me once more? He attempted to kiss her hand, but Arnoa pulled it back, firmly stating, No. Undeterred, Binas insisted, Give it some consideration, your imperial majesty. You have no experience in ruling. Adding, in this cutthroat world of politics, a naive soul like your imperial majesty will get tricked in the blink of an eye and lose everything. Arnoa questioned. A naive soul, you say? Reminding him. Didn't he call me mad a few days ago? Binas continued to argue. On the other hand, I have been ruling as a king for years now. A veteran ruler like me can see right through people just by looking at their faces. Proudly, he declared, I believe your imperial majesty needs a person like me. 
If you could look past our differences and find generosity in your heart. Arnoah confronted him, saying, Do you take me for a fool? Adding, You becoming the king of Duran was a tragedy, both for me and the people of Duran. Also, for someone with such great insight, don't you think you let yourself be tricked too easily? Upon hearing this, Bainas flinched and clenched his wrist, explaining, That's that's because it didn't cross my mind that a court physician could lie to me. I have stripped her of her title for making fools out of both of us. Arnoa responded, I'm glad you did. Binas, seeking affirmation, eagerly asked, I did good, yes? Arnoa informed him, I'm taking Dr. Ludes to the Empire with me. Binas, taken aback, started begging, Huh? I beg your pardon? Arnoa smiled and remarked, like you said, a naive soul like me could use the help of wise people. If she tricks someone as insightful as you, she must be quite brilliant. Standing up from the emperor's chair, she commanded, Anyway, King Binas, stop your blathering and bring me my dowry. Her beautiful white and gold carriage was brought there, and Anoa expressed, I'm loving this king's carriage. Maybe it's because it's made with my dowry. Binas began fighting with Larissa's father bringing joy to Arnoa. She thought, it was delightful to watch them fight. Binas, grabbing Larissa's father by the collar, screamed, You! You have been trying to kill the Empress! I'm confiscating your assets! However, her father denied the accusation, saying, No! Arnoa contemplated, trying to make each other pay more. Even then, he couldn't pay me back in full, so he had to give up the king's carriage as well. While riding in the carriage, she remarked to Binas, You could pay me in gold. Binas, with a hint of resignation, asked, Do you really have to take it from me? Adding, Please take it. I enjoy walking. Arnoa settled into the carriage, and Belle, already inside, questioned her. So you're sparing the Count, huh? Are you sure that's wise with everything he has done to you? Arnoa replied, Why does it matter? He will bother me no more. Bell acknowledged. That's generous of you. Leaning towards him, Arnaud inquired. I meant to ask, will your duty be finished after you arrive at the Empire? Bell, dressed in royal attire, replied. I suppose so. The new Empress has been chosen. Smiling, Arnaud suggested. Bell, don't go back to the Enchanted Tower. Join me in the capital. Bell, surprised, asked. The capital? Blushing, he added, Why would I go to the capital? Wondering if she knew something, he thought. Does she? Arnoa burst into laughter and explained, If you, the Lord of Prahan and the Master of the Enchanted Tower, are there, the nobles won't form a union and give me trouble. She continued, People outside Prahan tend to shun sorcerers. But if you attend noble meetings as a lord, that might change. It's a win-win. Bell, sitting pouting, turned his head and expressed, It might be a win for you, but it's just bothersome to me. Arnoa assured, I knew it. I won't twist your arm. Bell glanced at her and noted, You seem to know something of politics. Arnoa shared, A little, thanks to my mother, for an unknown reason. Emotionally, she added, Mother taught me many things. Perhaps too many. Luciano considered me as a rival ever since mother taught me disciplines of kingship. Bell declared, Anyway, I cannot stay in the capital. I must return to the tower. Arnaud asked, Is there something wrong with your domain? Playfully, she placed her hand on her mouth and behaved cute, saying, Oh. Bell observed her, twisting his arms. Arnaud reminisced about her past, sitting beside her mother in a blue royal dress. Her mother patted her head and advised, Arnoa, even the emperor can't meddle with affairs that happen in the domains of sorcerers. Reminding her daughter, she said, Remember, the masters of the enchanted tower have a nasty temper. In the carriage, Arnoa realized, I forgot my mother's teachings after spending some time with Belle. Belle, seated close to her, remarked, That's a dangerous question you're asking. Closing the distance, he inquired, does this mean you're not afraid of me anymore? Arnoa, feeling scared, stuttered. I'm in danger. Bell smiled, recalling. 
You were terrified of me when we first met. Blushing, Arnoa smiled and admitted, Sorry, I see Snowy when I see you now. In her thoughts, she sighed in relief, thinking, Phew, he doesn't look angry. Belle sat back, being cute, and stated, Officially, my spirit form is a snow leopard. Even Anakin doesn't know what my spirit form is. Arnoa pondered, Must sorcerers have a scary spirit form? When they're actually just a cat and a raccoon? Belle shared, My mother's spirit form was a fire dragon. Astonished, Arnoa exclaimed, A fire dragon? Belle explained, Yes, that's how the masters of the enchanted tower are supposed to be. An invincible force no one can challenge. Arnoa thought, So the great sorcerer Amaryllis was a dragon. Adding, Somehow, I think I understand why she wanted her son's spirit form to be a cat. Smiling, she said, I must say, a cat is cuter. Belle twitched and asked, Cute, you say? Arnoa confirmed. Yes, it's warm when I hug it. Belle glared for a moment, then transformed into a cat, meowing and jumping on her. Arnoa, surprised, said, H, hold on, Belle. You're not a real cat. You're a person. Realizing his provocation, she sighed while hugging him. Ugh, he's provoking me because I called him cute. After confessing her thoughts, Belle started cuddling with her. The next day, in the royal castle meeting room, someone wondered aloud. I wonder if he will arrive today. It has been weeks since I heard of the emperor's passing. Where is the new emperor? Questioned Baron Vent, seated at the meeting table. Another person, Duke Rickle, inquired. Have you heard any news from Duran? Marquis Duba replied. I should have, but no. Duke, frustrated, ground his teeth, stating, It's been a month since Anakin Willow sent the messenger, but Duran is strangely quiet. I finished preparing early for nothing. Baron slid his arm on the table, expressing, Did anyone else send a message to Duran? It's absurd they're staying so silent when their king became the emperor. Countess Herman, fully dressed in a party outfit with a diamond necklace, raised her hand and admitted, I did. Well, I tried to anyway. Baron turned to her, asking, What do you mean? Countess sighed, explaining, Strangely, I couldn't even confirm if the message arrived at all. I'm still waiting for the reply. Baron, furious, questioned, What was on your message? Marquis laughed loudly, suggesting, Do you even have to ask? She must have sent her niece's portrait. Baron added, a bold move, offering a mistress to the new emperor who didn't even arrive yet. Countess, irritated, warned him. Don't make a fuss. You must tame the emperor when he's still young and oblivious. Baron dismissed the idea, saying, One might consider that treason. If this emperor is dumb enough to fall for a honey trap, I'll just resign and return to my dominion. Marquis smirked, advising. Broaden your sights. The new emperor is clueless. Someone has to take advantage of him. He continued, I'm sure it's not just Countess Herman and I who are preparing to shower him with gold. Pointing upward with his finger, he boasted, I already prepared the jewels to offer to the emperor. I even had the imperial palace decorated in Duran's color so he can see it when he arrives. Turning to Countess, he wished, Good luck seducing him with a mistress. Countess laughed and replied, the gold you generously offered will be used well by my niece, who is going to be the emperor's mistress. Marquis pointed at Countess and taunted. You don't know, do you? He revealed. The new emperor, Duran's king, already has a mistress whom his majesty loves dearly. Everyone knows a love story in Duran. Countess, contemplating, placed her hand on her chin and said, Hmm, a mistress, huh? Maybe I shall have her killed. Things will get complicated if she gives birth to his child. Marquis laughed, endorsing the idea. Haha, that is not a bad idea. No matter what we bribe him with, when Grand Duke Asselier returns, the new emperor will soon become a mere figurehead. Countess agreed. Then we better make the most of the situation before he returns. Marquis expressed. I'm glad we see eye to eye on this. Turning to Duke Rickle, Marquis asked. 
You must be over the moon, Duke Rickle. Confused, Rickle inquired. About what, might I ask? Marquis informed him. Your niece became the Imperial Queen. He added, Isn't it nice that the forgotten Imperial Princess is becoming the Imperial Queen just like her mother? No one will lock her in a tower now. Rickle reluctantly agreed. Like you said, it's nice. But as long as Grand Duke Asselier pulls the strings, it's all meaningless. Meanwhile, Arno arrived, wearing a white dress with black heels. Marquis, unaware of her identity, asked, W.H., who are you? He screamed, This is a closed meeting. We don't take guests, Arnoa calmly replied. We met a few times when I was young. Have you forgotten me, Marquis Dubert? Rickle, startled, looked at her. Marquis stammered, Pardon me? Arnoa, placing her hand on a chair, said, So you haven't heard? I see word travels slowly around here. Huh! She confidently sat on the royal chair, and Marquis screamed, W.H., what are you? H., how dare you? That seat is reserved for the emperor. Get off! Arnoa smiled and declared, I am the new empress of the empire. Arnoa entered the meeting room and confidently took her seat in the emperor's chair, surprising all the members. She declared, I am the new empress of the empire. Marquis slammed the table, exclaiming, Nonsense! Duran's king is the new emperor. Arnoa, with a smirk, responded, Oh, that must be why the palace is overflowing with purple things, tossing a pillow onto the floor. Panicking, Marquis shouted, What are you doing? Arnoa nonchalantly waved her hand, saying, I'm sick of purple things. Keep things like purple sapphires out of my sight, would you? Marquis, furious, demanded, Enough! Reveal who you are right now! Arnoa retorted, Not the smartest bunch, are you? Did I not just say that I'm the new empress? She turned to Belle, standing beside her, and ordered, Belle, perhaps they need to hear it from you. Bell stepped forward, introducing himself as Belcherius, the master of the enchanted tower and the lord of Perhen. He confirmed, I just returned after fulfilling my duty as the messenger of the empire. Marquis questioned, Belcherius, is she telling the truth? Bell assured him, She is. The empire has a new ruler, and her name is Arnoa Saliard Cajun. The members were astonished, staring at Arnoa. Bell declared, I'll hail the Empress. While Arnoa proudly sat on the Emperor's chair, legs crossed. Baron stood up and exclaimed, Arnoa, the Imperial Princess? Oh my! Baron exclaimed. He added, I didn't recognize your Imperial Majesty because it's the first time I'm seeing you since you went to Duke Rickles Manor. Marquis interrupted, stammering, H. Hold on! To my knowledge, the marriage contract between Duran's king and your imperial majesty says that the king will receive the title of emperor. He questioned, Why would your imperial highness become the empress? Did the king of Duran die or something? Arnoa calmly replied, He and I divorced a few days ago. That contract is now null and void, she added with a smile. With Luciano and Arian under the ground, I am the rightful heir to the throne. I am still waiting for you to hail me, so do make it quick. Baron, shocked, glanced at her and hesitantly asked, A all hail the Empress? Arnoa calmly responded, All hail Empress. All hail Empress. She reflected on her past, thinking, It doesn't seem like I'm being welcomed. It doesn't surprise me. Reminiscing about her childhood, she continued, The nobles ignored me when I was young. Some even laughed as I, the imperial princess under the shadow of Luciano got married off as if I was getting exiled from the empire. Arnoa added, I didn't ask to be on the throne, but it's not that bad now that I'm on it. While sitting on the emperor's chair, she indulged in her own thoughts. What matters now is that I'm here as the new empress. As Arnoa and Belle were in the room, someone entered, exclaiming, Noah! It was Arnoa's friend, Anakin, wearing a pink royal suit. Arnoa, excited, hugged him tightly. She giggled and asked, Why did you have to write the letter like that? Anakin laughed and replied, 
Ha ha ha, would it kill you to say you miss me first? Belle stood in irritation beside them. Anakin added, I thought of you every day I trust you, but him? Men. Arnoa responded. It was the worst way to say that I should become the Empress. Belle stood pouting, and Anakin explained. I was worried the messenger boy might open the letter before you. It was a sort of a safety device. I trust you, but him? Men. He touched her face and continued. But you got the message and became the new ruler. And returned to me. Arnoa, happy to see him, leaned on him and asked. I did, didn't I? Anakin hugged her tightly with excitement. Arnoa pleaded, let go of me. But Anakin insisted, no, I haven't seen you in ages. Arnoa explained, I know, it's just... And as Belle dragged her away, she asked, Are you two really friends? Belle said, No. While Anakin said, Yes. Belle screamed, I prefer being alone, but he latched on. Anakin, laughing, said, I took pity on this friendless troll and hung out with him at the academy. Arnoa intervened. I can picture what happened. And stopped their fight, saying, Okay, that's enough. Catch up on your own time. She placed her hand on Anakin and said, We have a more pressing matter at hand. Can you guess what it is, Anakin? Anakin knelt and held her hand, saying, Just give me an order, your imperial majesty. Arnoa was astonished, and Anakin appointed himself as her official advisor. Bell questioned, Do you trust him? You should sleep on it. Arnoa replied, I do. He's an old friend. She added, Talented individuals like Anakin are extremely rare in the Empire. Anakin was happy to hear the compliment and swore allegiance to her. Bell warned, Be careful. He griffed many people at the academy. Anakin replied with a smile, Me winning against you at checkers is not grifting. I won because I was good at it, and you were not. Bell got irritated and shouted, Did I tell you that he used to be a lone shark? People lost houses because of him. Anakin retorted, Don't forget to mention that you used to absorb other people's mana and collect soul stones for fun. Arnoa intervened. Enough. I can see you both had a colorful life at the academy. She asked Belle for a moment to talk to Anakin, and Belle jumped on the sofa in response. Arnoa looked at him, sighed, and said, Anakin, how bad is the situation of the Empire? He replied, it's downright awful. She reminisced about her past, saying, While Luciano was sick in bed, the nobles took control of most of the real power. Thus, the nobles are unlikely to submit properly to the new empress. Anakin added, The ones who wield the most power are Grand Duke Asselier and his daughter, Lady Roxanne Asselier. And they will come for you. Arnoa, at the age of ten, stood in her hunting outfit, fervently waving her arms in front of a horse urging someone holding a sword to sheath it. Shivering, she pleaded, Sheath your sword! This horse did its best and won second place. Get out of my way! A red-headed girl named Roxanne, also ten, dragged Arnoa away, declaring, I have no use for a horse that gives me, Roxanne Asselier, second place. In a swift motion, Roxanne splashed the horse with water, and Arnoa exclaimed, Do you see how it's suffering in pain? Roxanne, lifting a blood-dripping sword, blamed Arnoa, stating, It's because you stopped me. Roxanne Asselier, falling short of first place in a horse-riding competition was reason enough for her to put her own horse down. She was much too cruel for a child of her age, just as bad as her father who killed a soldier for not winning a spearmanship competition, perhaps even worse. Anakin informed Arnoa, She kills people nowadays, just like her father. She still doesn't care for losing. Arnoa questioned. Then she should have returned victorious by now. Why is she camping in Kesman? Is there a reason for that? Anakin waved his hand, replying. Noah, don't act like you don't know why. There's no better excuse than a war to siphon the Empire's treasury. She's milking the war for all it's worth. Arnoa, reflecting on this, thought. Just as I thought. She added. Roxanne is like the sword of the Empire right now. The problem is that the sword keeps pointing the sharp end to its master. 
She must have been planning to make Arian the emperor and play him like a fiddle. She will try to kill me when she hears the news. Anakin smiled and remarked, Well, yes. She knows you're not her lapdog like Arian. Pointing his finger, he said, All the more reason to clean house before the Asilies arrive. Arnoa inquired, How are the relationships among the nobles? Anakin, smiling, replied, As I said, downright awful. They despise and keep each other in check, Anakin explained, adding, They look down on the imperial family, but at the same time, they're desperate to make people from their families aides of the imperial family. Arnoa questioned him. You turned them against each other, didn't you? Anakin, with a mischievous grin, replied, Who else but little old me? Of course, I did. He elaborated. I did what I could to keep them from forming a union but I'm afraid it won't be that way forever. When they start considering you as an enemy, it won't take long until they form an alliance, even if it's a temporary one. Arnoa contemplated for a moment and said, So, what you're saying is that I need to bring at least one person to my side before that, right? Waving her hand, she asked, Then tell me, which family is powerful enough to stand against the Grand Duke and is likely to stand by my side as well? Anakin revealed. There is only one family, and you know it. They continued discussing the Emperor's current situation seriously. Arnoa clenched her hand and said, Accept them. Anakin waved his hand, replying, There is no one else. Arnoa persisted. Think harder. Who do you think would be able to restrain the Grand Duke, the ruler of the North, besides Duke Rickle? Anakin interrupted. The Sovereign of the South? Arnoa considered other options, suggesting. How about Baron Vent? He's relatively loyal and strong, but his family is small. He wouldn't risk bringing his family to ruin for loyalty. There's also Countess Herman. She detests losses. She wouldn't lift a finger unless she was sure she would benefit from aiding you. Arnoa placed her hand on her head, pondering. Ha, would Duke Rickle agree to be on my side? She remembered a moment when guards were dragging her out of the court, crying and wailing. Uncle! Uncle! Her uncle stood still as she screamed. You know me. I would never do such a thing. Arnoa gave a firm order to Anakin. Get me a meeting with him. Anakin bowed, and she added. Go tell him I'm on my way. Anakin replied. As you wish. And turned towards Bell, saying. And aren't you done here? Go home. Lying on the sofa, Bell replied. So this is what you were worried about back in the carriage. Are you planning on making the Duke your ally? Arnoa sighed and replied. I have no other choice since you turned me down. Bell asked. Does that mean I'm your first choice? Arnoa leaned on him and said. If I said yes, would you stay? He rose from the sofa, stating. No. Like Anakin said, I'm done here. I'm going home, Bell declared. Arnoa remarked. It's a shame. I knew you would say that. Bell swished his hair and added. However, I'm planning on returning soon. He smiled and said. The capital is more fun than I thought. Duke Rickles sat on the dining table, drinking tea. Bowing in front of Arnoa, he greeted. Your Imperial Majesty, Arnoa acknowledged. It's been a while, Duke Rickle. Please have a seat. They both sat at the dining table, an awkward silence lingering. Arnoa began. Consider what happened. Rickle interjected. In the past. Arnoa replied. Forgiven. Rickle insisted. Forgotten. Then, he suddenly raised his voice. Forgiven? I believe our family has never wronged you, your majesty. Arnoa slammed the table and shouted. Are you saying handing me over to Luciano just because he asked didn't make you feel sorry for me at all? She continued loudly. Three years ago, after Luciano's coronation, you served me up to him on a silver platter when he said he would interrogate me for plotting treason. Arnoa emphasized. I may not be a rickle, but I am your sister's daughter. No one in his right mind would send off their niece to die just like that. Rickle defended himself. It was the late emperor who forced ill fate upon you, not me, your imperial majesty. Flinching at the table, he added, I did my best at the time. 
Arnoa asked him sternly. Your best? Did you just say you did your best? Arnoa conversed with her uncle, Duke Rickle. He questioned. Your best? Arnoa sought clarification. Did you just say you did your best? Rickle affirmed. Yes, I did. I did my best to make your imperial majesty stay at my manor as comfortable as possible. Reflecting on her difficult past, Arnoa recounted. During the time between Empress Anastia's death and Luciano's order to have me taken away, I lived as a guest with my mother's relatives, Duke Rickle's family. She added, It was clear that they never thought of me as their family. Everyone was always so polite and treated me like I was made of glass. The Duke never expressed malice toward me or treated me poorly. It was me who had false hope. She reflected, I took out my anger on the wrong person. He is indeed not at fault. She added, Even for the Sovereign of the South, it would have been difficult to defy the Emperor's order. Not only that, I was charged with treason. If Duke Rickle had protected me, House Rickle would have faced charges of treason as well. Even so, I can't help but feel betrayed to some extent. While seated at the dining table, she inquired of Rickle, If you really aimed to do your best, you could have at least told me where I was being taken to. Rickle explained, I couldn't. The late emperor had forbidden me to. Arnoa replied, I see. I understand. Being uncertain, she asked him, By the way, what did you mean by forgetting about the past? Rickle screamed out in rage, Isn't it obvious? Arnoa expressed, You've appointed Anakin Willow, the most talented son of House Willow, as your advisor, fully aware that House Willow is a vassal of House Rickle. She added, As the Imperial Advisor, I'm here to request a meeting on behalf of the Empress. Rickle was astonished, clenching his hand and trembling as he said, I have been investing in House Willow for ages. If it had not been for your Imperial Majesty, Anakin would have become my advisor instead. Rickle reminded her, you of all people should be aware that House Rickle highly values talent. He added, Your Imperial Majesty has taken the most valuable asset of my family and the greatest genius in the Empire. He asked her, Did you really think I wouldn't resent you for it? Of course, I know what House Rickle values the most. My mother taught me that. On hearing this, Arnoa was in intense shock. She remembered her mother saying, Remember Noah. Wherever you go, see just one person who has the greatest potential to be your aid. And give that person all of your trust and affection so that they would even risk their life for you if so desired. While reminiscing, she thought, I took her words to heart and tried my best when choosing my aides. Dr. Ludes and Anakin are great examples of that. She immediately realized why her uncle got angry. I can see why the Duke is mad. He's been investing in Anakin and I just took him away. Rickle clacked a cup of tea and said, That being said, I suppose it's my fault as well. I failed to make my house attractive enough for a genius like him, so I will put this behind me. Arnoa started thinking, Perhaps either of us is in a position to blame each other. She said, Duke Rickle, I have a proposition. On the other hand, a castle was surrounded by fire, and people were screaming in distress. Servants wearing white and red dresses were startled and flinched, murmuring. Not a day goes by without her breaking something. One of them whispered to another. I was surprised she agreed to the request of Kessman to halt the battle during the harvest season. Another replied, irritated. I just hope she doesn't take it out on us. A girl wearing a red dress stood, looking at a hole created in the wall. A person said to her, Calm down, Roxanne. She, holding a sword, replied, Calm down? Do you seriously expect me to calm down when the throne has been usurped by a thief? She tossed and threw her sword, saying, Ha! Huh. Imperial Princess Arnoa as the Empress? What a sick joke! A red-headed man said to her, Getting upset won't change what happened. Roxanne replied, Are you saying that I'm just throwing a tantrum? Her father added, Of course not, my daughter. I meant. She interrupted him, saying, It's been over a month since Luciano died. Stepping forward, she added, 
how Sassilier is supposed to be the real master of the continent. So tell me why. While grinding her teeth, she said, It took us this long to find out who the next empress is. She screamed in rage. What the hell happened? What caused the late coronation? Why was her divorce right before that? Her father replied, It wasn't our fault. Putting his hand on his face, he said, if anyone is to blame, it's that idiot, Duran's king. He apparently divorced an imperial princess to be with his mistress. He added, without knowing he might have become the emperor. After hearing this, Roxanne started screaming in rage. I refuse to believe that such a moron exists in this world. Her father replied, yes, it was hard to believe for me as well. He even had to return all of his former queen's dowry including the jewels of Empress Anastia. Roxanne asked him, Who are we up against? He added, You said it yourself? He's a moron. Roxanne asked again, I meant the Empress. Her father laughed and said, Don't worry. She is painfully ordinary. Roxanne didn't understand, so she asked for an explanation. Please elaborate. Her father started telling her, she was born to the imperial family, but she couldn't even get educated properly since her mother died early. She let a weakling like Luciano abuse her, and she even let that moron of Duran and his mistress walk all over her. He added, The hardest thing she went through in her life is her divorce. Roxanne commented, She was basically a punching bag. The throne deserves better. She started thinking, That's what became of Empress Anastia's daughter. Wasn't she more like? Her father was saying. In other words, she will make a better puppet than Arian. Roxanne said. Then let us send a warning. She stomped on the sword and said. A warning more direct than what we sent to Duran's king. The empress will kneel before House Asselier or die. All the members have gathered for the meeting with Anoa. One of them remarked. So the princess, no, the empress returned to the empire after getting a divorce? Another individual engaged in conversation with a man beside him, stating, Duran's king, who adores his mistress, declared a divorce with her imperial majesty soon after the late emperor passed away. Meanwhile, Marquis interjected. He gave up the chance to have the entire continent for a mistress, huh? I must say, that was the most idiotic move in history. Adding to the discussion, Marquis continued, I can't believe such a moron exists on the continent. Another person seated in front of him remarked. He must not have known. I heard he got sick from crying too much. Addressing the political implications, one of them questioned. Does that mean our new empress came to power because she got divorced? The conversation at the table revolved around the new empress, with someone sharing. She was the youngest among three siblings, and she lost her mother early. She probably doesn't know much about politics. Another person chimed in. She would have to depend on us, the nobles, then. A young man, adorned in brown and black royal attire, declared, I shall see if I can get one of my people to become her aide. Baron, seated in front of him, replied, I don't know. She didn't seem that naive to me. Ah, uh, you won't fool me. The response came swiftly. You say that but I know you're just trying to beat me to it. Offended, Baron retorted, I'm not. Meanwhile, someone alerted them. The Empress has come. Arnoa, adorned in a beautiful white royal dress, entered the room. As everyone stood up to greet her, they bowed, saying, Your Imperial Majesty. Arnoa graciously took her seat on the Emperor's chair, stating, Thank you for your warm welcome. Have a seat. Anakin stood beside her chair, capturing everyone's attention. The members contemplated. So she is the new empress. Actually, unlike the rumors, she doesn't look naive at all. Arnoa began addressing the gathering, expressing gratitude. I am grateful to all of you who have been keeping the troubled empire together until now. Flipping a paper, she continued. Let us begin the meeting. I believe there is an issue about the war with Kessman. Sir Dubert? Murmurs circulated as she delved straight into the topic. Marquis, taken aback, asked, So suddenly, your imperial majesty? Arnoa replied, Are you not prepared? 
It was you who reported it, was it not? Marquis, momentarily rattled, admitted. It was me indeed. Thinking. I was planning to ease into it, but here we go. Standing up, Marquis informed her. Curtly, Grand Duke Asselier is engaged in fierce battles alongside the Grand Duchess against the Kingdom of Kesman. Not so long ago, there was even the tragedy of the special force, organized by the Grand Duke, being annihilated by the enemy. Arnoa flipped a page, frowned, and remarked. Ah, yes. The unit made of Duranians. Marquis couldn't help but think. How does she know that? Flinching, he replied. And as you well know, funds are needed to overcome such adversities. While holding the paper, Arnoa inquired. Did the Grand Duke request funds from the Empire again? Continuing, she stated. According to the record, it's the third time this year. Marquis cleared his throat and explained. It has been a difficult war. However, Arnoa interrupted. Difficult, is it? Even with ten times more soldiers than Kesman? The Kesmanian army must be quite formidable. Marquis, taken aback, thought. Did she just mock the Grand Duke? He twitched and replied. Kesman has rugged terrain. That allows the Kesmanians to have an advantage in battles. Arnoa sighed, stating. To my knowledge, the military funds allocated for this year have all been depleted by the last request. She questioned. How would the Empire raise funds on such short notice? Marquis, attempting reassurance, laughed and said, There is nothing to be worried about, Your Imperial Majesty. The funds requested by the Grand Duke and the Grand Duchess are actually not as much as you might think. He even specified when and how to obtain the funds. Smirking, he added, He said Your Imperial Majesty's dowry that was returned after your divorce would suffice. It was a carriage filled with gold and a pair of black diamonds, was it not? On hearing this, Baron immediately chimed in. Arnoa pondered. Wow. He wants me to hand over the dowry I got back in the name of military funds? She was well aware of their intentions, asserting. The dowry someone brings to their marriage belongs only to them. No one can take it away, as it's private property. Emphasizing her point, she added. Even a husband must return it when he gets a divorce. Asking to hand that over means that he is blatantly asking for my obedience to him, the army commander of the empire. Marquis, seemingly dismissive, flipped his arms and said, I know it must be offensive, your imperial majesty, but you must swallow your pride. He continued, Look at the bigger picture. Had the Grand Duke and the Grand Duchess not defended the north, the empire might have already collapsed. There is no one who can replace the Grand Duke as the army commander. He placed his hand on his forehead, with his thumb pointing down to his eyes, smirking as he said, If your imperial majesty knew the significance of this war, you would accept the Grand Duke's request. Baron thought, The man sure has a silver tongue. Arnoa rustled her hand on the paper and acknowledged, I understand. The late emperor did leave the war effort solely to the Grand Duke. Laughing, Marquis clapped and exclaimed, Exactly! You should show your gratitude to the Grand Duke by offering him your private property as the military funds. Arnoa turned to the other members, inquiring, Is there anyone who is against this idea? Marquis added confidently, Against you say? Arnoa suggested, Would a peace treaty not be better than prolonging a war with an uncertain end? One person, Sir Nore, chimed in, your imperial majesty must not know what the empire has gone through lately. Sir Nore complimented. Although we're currently in a year-long stalemate, the Grand Duke and the Grand Duchess have saved the empire from the crisis of collapse several times. Arnoa thought. A crisis of collapse, he says? The Cajun empire that practically spans the entire continent? Yeah, right. Nore supported Marquis's suggestion. He speaks the truth. The Grand Duke is the savior of the empire. Adding to the argument, Nori mentioned. Moreover, the fiancé of the Grand Duchess recently perished in a battle against the enemy, so there should also be compensation as consolation for her loss. Marquis added with a smirk. In fact, I'm not sure the return dowry alone is enough. A person sitting beside him agreed. I agree. 
are Noah, realizing the manipulative tactics, thought. So this is how they want to play it, huh? She declared. I've heard enough. To tease her, Marquis said. Should we go fetch the carriage? Arnoa calmly replied. No. With a smile, she added. Like you said, I still am clueless about the recent situation of the Empire. Marquis, flinching at her response, asked. Then why not just do as we advised? Arnoa tapped on the table and asserted. No, let's put a pin in that for now. I am not ignoring your advice. I understand what you want me to do very well, and I need some time to think about it. Shocked glances were exchanged among the members. Nori thought, she'll do as we say in the end. Smirking, there is no way she can defy the Grand Duke. All she can do is to reject a few times to save face. Arnoa handed over a notepad to Anakin and said, As for this matter, I will decide what to do in the next meeting after giving it due consideration. She added, You can write a letter to me if you have any opinions until then. Let us conclude the meeting. Arnoa started leaving, and Anakin offered, Your Majesty, allow me to take you to the audience chamber. She turned back and ordered, Let's go. Reflecting on her conversation with Duke Rickle, she reminisced, Duke Rickle, I have a proposition. A proposition? For me? I know that Rickles never betray their own family. It's one of the things my mother taught me. She added, My mother was a Rickle, yet I carry Cajun's name. I understand that is why it is hard for you to accept me as a member of House Rickle. That must also be the reason why you're reluctant to stand by my side immediately. A girl with blonde hair, wearing a beautiful royal blue dress, greeted Arnoa, saying, Your Imperial Majesty, Penelope Rickle, at your service. <laughs>